right, let's take our Bibles tonight. Open up with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Tonight, as you're turning to 2 Corinthians 10, have you ever been the victim of false accusations? How did you handle it? The story is told about a guy by the name of Jim. Jim was driving along late one night, and uh, there was this hitchhiker out on the road, and so Jim just felt kind of compelled inside. He thought, well, maybe I ought to pick the hitchhiker up. So Jim picks the guy up, and as they're driving along quite a distance, Jim begins to question if that was a smart thing to do. Uh, the hitchhiker was, looked a little shady, maybe a little seedy, and uh, Jim's thinking, boy, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't have done this. And so Jim starts to get a little bit nervous, and he reaches over. His coat was in the middle in between on the console, and he reaches over, and he kind of felt his coat, and he thought, my billfold's missing. And right now, I mean, he started really patting his coat down. Can't find his billfold. Right now, Jim whips that car over, and he tells the hitchhiker, he says, get out of my car. He says, turn over my billfold right now. I want that billfold out of your hands right now. And that poor hitchhiker reaches into his pocket, and he gives him the billfold, and Jim speeds off and heads home. And Jim gets into the house, and he's telling his wife what happened. She says, oh, by the way, all he got out of his mouth was that he picked up a hitchhiker. And she says, oh, by the way, Jim, did you know you left your billfold on the dresser in the bedroom? <laughs> oh, that poor hitchhiker. <laughs> False accusations are fairly easy to handle when you can present the facts and you can kind of say, explain. You know, this is what really takes place. However, undoing the perception that has been cast by false accusations that's sometimes an entirely different story. Now, what do you do when somebody has the basic facts right in front of them and it still doesn't make any difference? What do you do when they have been presented with those facts and they still come up with the wrong conclusion? How do you handle that? The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 is going to shift gears and even his tone as he finishes out the rest of this book. Remember, 1 Corinthians dealt with the issues that were going on in this church. And then 2 Corinthians has dealt with a variety of things. And as we finish out this book in the next few chapters, Paul's tone is obviously different as he addresses the accusations that are being leveled against him. And so the message title tonight is graciously, or excuse me, the grace to graciously defend yourself. The grace to graciously defend yourself. Now, we can defend ourselves, right? That's not a problem. You say, come on, you want to say that to me again? I'll pop you right in the mouth. No, that's not being gracious. Paul says, I want you to know how to do it graciously. And so as Paul does this, uh, just kind of summarize the last chapters. In essence, Paul says, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the facts. And he says, if you're willing to accept those we're going to let bygones be bygones. I'm not going to hold this against you because grace doesn't hold a grudge. And so he's letting these people know this as he tries to explain himself. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, we're actually going to start in the middle of the chapter to look at the complaint. The complaint is in verses 8, and 10, 8 through 10. He says, For though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which the Lord hath given us for edification and not for your destruction, I should not be ashamed that I may not seem as if I would terrify you by letters. For his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. The complaint that has been given is in three parts. The first part of the complaint is the permission. The permission. Once again, Paul's authority is being questioned, and they're essentially saying to him, what right do you have to say the things you have been saying to us? What gives you the right to do that? You know, it is our human nature to buck authority. We just don't like being told what to do. You see this all the way back in uh, the garden. Actually, before that, when Satan rebels against the authority of God and is removed from heaven, and he takes a third of the angels with him, we see it in the garden where God's authority was very crystal clear as to what they were to do and what they were not to do. And the one rule that they were given, they quickly break it, it seems, uh, that it didn't take them long to do that. And we're no different today. We don't like authority. From the time of being a child, kids have issues with parental authority, with the authority of teachers, with the authority of administrators. Parents have an issue with their boss, their homeowners association, maybe with the government. 
Church members, they have an issue with a department head or, well, I know not here with the pastor, but in other churches with the pastor, they have issues. All Christians have an issue with God's authority, with the Word of God, and people will find all sorts of ways to buck authority. We don't like authority. We don't like somebody telling us what we ought to do. Paul's apostolic authority was being questioned by some of the church, and they're saying, what right do you have to tell us anything? Well, keep your marker here and go with me, if you will, back to the book of Acts chapter 26. I want us to see where Paul's authority comes from. And Paul has frequently shared this as he shares his testimony. And this authority that Paul has is not something that he took upon himself, but rather it was an authority that had been given to him. Paul says in Acts 26, as he's testifying uh, here of his conversion, it says in verse 14, And when we were all fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith, that is in me. Who gave Paul the authority? The Lord gave him the authority. So as Paul goes into these churches and he gives the messages and he even delivers the correction, what right do you have, Paul, to say these things? He says, I have God's right. It's not my right. It's not something I've taken upon myself. God has given me the right to do this. I want us to take this and I want us to apply this. Go with me to Romans chapter 13. Here's something, Christians, that we have got to understand, and I tell you, this is very, very pertinent to today. In Romans chapter 13, we find out that all authority figures are put in their places by God. The Bible doesn't tell us that all good ones are. It says that all authority is put into their places by God. Romans 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Does God raise up and tear down leaders all across the world, good and bad? Does God do that? All authority has been put into place by God. If we rebel and we refuse that authority figure, who are we really fighting against? Well, let's just give you some clarification. Verse 2, whosoever therefore resisteth the power, now the power being that of man's authority, resisteth the ordinance of God. God's the one that gave them the authority, put them in the place of authority, and they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. When those authority figures, when they give some sort of edicts or commands or laws or whatever, and you say, well, I don't like that. I don't agree with that. I don't like them. I don't agree with them. Who put the authority figure in place? God put them there, good or bad. What's our obligation? Our obligation is to obey them. When those authority figures cross God's authority, that's when we have the obligation to obey and to follow God and to refuse to submit to man's authority. When they cross God's authority, folks, that is something, and this kind of concerns me just a little bit, because I think in America today, we have forgotten the difference between God's authority and man's authority. And even in the Christian church, among believers in Christ, we have forgotten it. When we do not like or agree with man's authority that doesn't cross God's authority, we are still obligated to obey man's authority. We're supposed to do it with a good attitude, with the right attitude behind it, praying for those leaders. And if it is something that needs to be changed, we have the legal means to go about doing it. And that is certainly something that we can do. But when when you have Christians will stand up against the things that are going on and with such an ugly and a hateful attitude, that reveals something that is wrong with our hearts. 
Let me tell you something, Christians. I am an American. I am proud to be an American. I have absolutely no problem with nationalism. I think this is the greatest land that we could possibly live in. But I am a Christian first. And that means so much more than being an American. So much more. And Christians, my rights, my freedoms, my liberties, my responsibilities are not guaranteed to me by a man-made document called the Constitution of the United States. My rights and freedoms and privileges and responsibilities are guaranteed to me by a God-inspired book. And this book rests higher than the Constitution of the United States. And it is to this book and to the God who gave us this book and to the kingdom from where this book came from that our allegiance has to be. Not to this nation, but to that nation. That's where we are called. That's where our citizenship is at. And it seems that Christianity today has forgotten that. Oh, I have my rights. The Constitution. Blah, 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 blah. Shut up. What does the Bible say? Where are your rights in the Bible? What does the Bible tell you to do? You don't hear too many Christians yammering and getting all bent up out of shape because what the Bible tells me to do, and here's chapter and verse, and it's being denied to me. You don't hear that. I don't like this. I tell you all the time, I don't like speed limit signs. They're oppressive. The man put them in place. Down with the man. I don't like them things. Man, I want to get out there and drive. Why did GM put a speedometer that goes so fast, Mark? <laughs> if they didn't intend for you to drive it that way. So we are just being oppressed all over the place, right? Oh, Christians, God's word has got to come first. That's where our permission, our authority comes from. Our power comes from that. It comes from the Holy Spirit of God indwelling us and us following God's word to the letter. We're obligated to do that, Christian. Here's the next thing. Go back to 2 Corinthians. Chapter 10, verse 8. Again, for though I should boast somewhat more of our authority, which God hath given us for edification and not your destruction. So we have the permission. Let's talk about the purpose. This authority was given for edification not for destruction. When Paul provided correction to the Christians at Corinth, he was not trying to destroy them. He was trying to build them up. He was trying to help them grow in Christ. So long as sin is present in our life, we can't grow. If you want to grow in Christ, you got to get the sin out. you got to. Your garden, if you plant a garden this coming year, and uh, you put all you you work that ground. The ground looks great. Don't you love the smell of fr freshly turned dirt, especially at the beginning of the season? That dirt just has a special smell to it. And you look out, and that soil is just as clean and as black as it can be. And you got your rows nice and straight, and you've put your seeds in, and you're just anxious to watch that thing grow. And if nothing else grew in the garden but the seeds you planted, that'd be wonderful. But that's not the way it works. And so you got to get out there and you got to weed that garden. And the first year that we had a garden, was it, it was a flop, but not because of neglect. That was the year that Hannah had her first accident. And so right in the middle of the season, we are spending all of our time at the University of Michigan in, in Mott's Children's Hospital. Guess what's happening to the garden? Nothing. Well, the weeds are happening. And when I would come home to do a load of laundry or something and go back up and I'd look at that garden, it just made me sick inside. And so the garden didn't do well. Why? Because the weeds grew. Our life isn't going to do well because the weeds are growing. And here you have the Apostle Paul. He has God's permission. He has God's authority. He is like the, the pastor to these churches as a whole. He has the authority to deliver the Word of God. Why? Because the Christians got to get the sin out of your life if you're going to grow. And I know Paul's heart was to see him grow. And any pastor that loves his church, his desire is to see the people grow. And any Sunday school teacher that loves their class wants to see the people grow. How are you going to grow if you got sin in your life? 
Some of the people, though, when the Apostle Paul comes along and starts pointing at the different things, they didn't take that too well. Uh, How do you handle it when somebody comes into your life with constructive criticism? Almost seems like a misnomer in terms, doesn't it? Uh, What do they call that? An oxymoron. Uh, Constructive criticism. Uh, Some company called Rohrer, Hibbler, and Replogle wrote this in 1988. They said, constructive criticism is an invaluable source of information for those who accept it. Quite often, we spend more time justifying, excusing, or rationalizing an error than in trying to understand and benefit from the criticism. When we are non-defensive, we become aware that constructive criticism is a real compliment to us. The person offering it is usually uncomfortable in doing so, but if he is willing to endure the discomfort in order to help us, we should listen and appreciate his suggestions. He runs the risk of arousing our enmity, but he cares enough for our welfare to take that chance. We would do well not to take such quick offense if somebody comes and says something that they truly intend to be constructive criticism. You say, well, how do you know if it's constructive? Well, more than likely, if you are the one that was, all you're going to hear is criticism, right? And I'm the same way. All you hear is criticism. You say, well, how do you know if it is intended to be constructive? The Apostle Paul says, I came to edify, to build you up, not to tear you down. How does the person treat you as they're telling you something? Can you tell just by looking at them, by listening to their heart, can you tell that they care enough about you to tell you what you need to hear, to tell you the truth, not because they're trying to destroy you, but because they're trying honestly to help? I think one of the things that we need to ask ourselves before we would ever speak any kind of correction to anybody, we need to take a moment, take a deep breath, close our eyes for a second and think. What I'm getting ready to say, what is my heart's intent behind why I'm saying this? Do I want to build that person up, or is, am I really thinking to destroy them? Now, maybe we're not thinking about it in those terms, so let's put it in terms uh, we might be thinking. I'm going to tell them this. They need to be knocked down a peg or two. Well, that's going to be constructive, isn't it? No, because you're wanting to knock them down a peg or two. If that is your heart's attitude, to knock down a peg or two, that's destruction. You know what that means? Zip it. Don't say anything. Because if that is your attitude, you're coming to them with the wrong attitude. So don't say nothing. But they need to hear it. Yeah, I probably would agree with you, but not from you. There's things that need to be heard, but everybody shouldn't say them. Because everybody's not doing it to construct. Some are just doing it because they're just flat out mean. Bullies in the church. Church bullies. And they just want to tear people down. You know why? Because it makes them feel better about themselves. And that's wrong, Christian. Please, some of you are going to totally misconstrue, misunderstand, and I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time re-explaining it. You can go back and watch it on video. We need to have the right attitude. Yes. Are we supposed to help others? Yes. Are we supposed to constructively criticize? Yes. But we got to have the right attitude doing it. And that's what Paul was saying. He says, I, I have permission. Here's the purpose. Then in verse 10, for his letters say they are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech contemptible. So here's another complaint leveled against him. Paul, you're just homely in a mud fence. Who told you? Who told you you could speak? What made you think that you were a public speaker, Paul? You know, Paul didn't even argue about this. Look over to chapter 11 and verse 6. Paul says of of himself, he says, but though I be rude in speech. Now, not that he was saying things rudely, but crude, unpolished, unfinished. Though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Paul's authority and usability didn't come from his appearance or his abilities. It came from the Lord. You see, the complaints that were being leveled against Paul, they were saying, Paul, who gave you the right? Paul, you just came here to destroy us. Paul, look in a mirror. You just don't look like somebody that's got authority and like you know what you're doing. These were very nasty complaints given against him. 
this man of God. And we know he is a man of God. Very nasty complaints. How does Paul handle these? How would you handle it if somebody said these kinds of things about you? In 2009, there was a woman who shot to stardom overnight. The woman has Asperger's syndrome. In her own words, she said this about her appearance on stage. She says, I know what people were thinking, but it's not a beauty contest. As she walked out on the stage, and I, I please, I don't mean this in the least bit. I don't know any other way to describe it, but she was frumpy. She kind of plodded out on stage. So her, her stage presence was not uh, by any stretch of the imagination polished. The pre-performance interview on stage was awkward. The woman acted as if she couldn't put two sentences together. She couldn't make an a articulate reply. It just wasn't in the least a little bit polished. And as the judges are sitting there, the, you can just see them kind of rolled their eyes like, oh, this is going to be a doozy. And then she sang. And the song was, I Dreamed a Dream from Les Miserables. And the lady's name was Susan Boyle of Scotland. She competed in 2009, Britain's Got Talent, finished second overall, and shot to stardom. That woman's voice is, oh, I don't like opera. And this was gorgeous. I mean, just it melted you when you heard this lady sing. How many people judged her? And we all did, to be honest with you. She walked out on stage, we thought the same things. Oh, this is not going to be good. You just kind of envisioned where this was going. And when that first couple of notes popped out of her mouth, it was like, oh, wow. And you know what? We do that, and we, we think, oh, I shouldn't do that. And then we do it again. Oh, I shouldn't do that. And we do it again. What's it going to take to get us to stop doing that? to recognize that God sees something in each and every one of us sitting here tonight. And whether you see it or I see it in each other, doesn't matter. It's what God sees and how God wants to use each and every one of us. And there will be people that will come along with complaints and shoot their mouths off, make us feel bad about ourselves. And the only way that's ever going to stick is if we allow it. We have got to recognize God did not create me to just sit on a shelf and do nothing for him. God has a purpose for my life. And that's what the Apostle Paul is trying to get through to these people. And, and he's not disagreeing with them. Hey, yep, I may not look like what you expect, but I know what God has for my life. Do you tonight know what God has for your life? Can you graciously answer your critics? The second thing we see tonight is the confession. And we're not going to get through chapter 10 this evening. I was going to try it, but no. When I, when I was studying, this thing just kind of blew up, this chapter. So uh, the second point tonight, we'll have three more, Lord willing, next week, is the confession. The confession starts in chapter 10, verse 1. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold toward you. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence, wherewith I think to be bold against some, which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. As Paul is beginning to answer the question, Paul reveals why uh, there is kind of a threefold approach to his dealing with the church of Corinth. And here's the threefold approach. First of all, his attitude. We've got to check our attitudes, don't we? Paul has got the right attitude. He says in uh, that first verse, he says, with the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Take your Bible, go back to Matthew 11. The meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Matthew chapter 11 and verses 28 and 29. Matthew 11 verses 28 and 29. Paul says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Paul says his attitude is meek and gentle like Jesus. What do those terms mean? When we think about meekness, we tend to think, and it, I know it's cliche, but meekness is weakness. 
And we think if somebody is meek, they're this namby-pamby, little wimpy kind of an individual, and that must be what meekness is. Uh, you think of a meek spouse, and they're kind of uh, whipped into submission, and they don't, you know, they, they ask permission before they can talk kind of thing. Oh, what a meek individual. So we see it as a negative. Folks, meekness is a godly attribute and a godly virtue that our Savior possesses. So what is meekness? Meekness is gentleness of strength. Somebody has said that it is strength under control in order to serve somebody with a gentle spirit. It has absolutely nothing to do with our, our strength not being there, not being powerful. It means it's under control. When the Lord exhibited meekness, He exhibited His meekness uh, as He's washing the disciples' feet. Boy, couldn't He have really chewed them out good and been 100% right? Couldn't if he had done all sorts of things, but what does he do? In meekness, he takes the towel, he girds it about him, and he kneels down and he removes their sandals if they were still on, and he begins to wash their dirty, stinking feet. That's meekness. How many of us would have taken that first foot, and as we were washing it, maybe curled the toes back to the ankle? Or maybe gave it a good little twist. How's that feel? That wouldn't be meekness, would it? Could Jesus have done that? Could he phys- did he physically have the ability to do that? Oh, yeah. He could have put their foot up over their head if he wanted to. He didn't do that. He just very gently got down and began to wash their feet. His strength was shown in his service. Paul came to serve these people. Christians, I think that is, that's got to be one of the most important things that we recognize. Every one of us, every single one of us, have got to have the attitude of servanthood. We have to. We are here to serve the Lord Jesus Christ first. We are here to serve each other second. And it ought to be our mission that as we come into the doors of this church as a congregation, we are corporately together. How may I serve you? (laughs) If you went into a restaurant, you might be asked that. How may I serve you? Have you ever thought about your brothers and sisters in Christ? How may I serve you tonight? That's the attitude we're supposed to have. We ought to look for the opportunities to do that. That is the attitude of Christ, to have that gentleness. Gentleness means that we are taken into consideration. We take into consideration each other. Paul took into consideration the people he was addressing again. Yeah, he addressed the sin that was there. Why? Because the sin was affecting the church. It was affecting the purity of the body. He was taking it into consideration. He was being considerate of other people. Christians, that's what we're called to. That's his attitude. Now, his aspiration. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, again, verse 2, he says, I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as we walked according to the flesh. They accused him of being in present base, but being absent, he's bold. When Paul is away, the people said he's bold and blunt. Why? Because words on paper are not as harsh and exacting as if they were coming from the mouth of the individual standing right in front of you. What did Paul want when he was with the people? He wanted fellowship with them. He didn't want to have to come into the church and start ripping on them and start chewing on them and say this and this and this and this. So he writes them a letter so that the things could be corrected so that when he came, oh, it could be a nice time of fellowship together. Go with me to Romans chapter 1. And and the sad thing is that they didn't get this. Even though Paul writes this almost to every single one of the churches, Paul wanted fellowship with those people. He wanted to be with them. And you know what, Christians? As we are getting deeper and deeper and deeper into the last days, I don't understand 
And, and I'm not saying this here because, boy, what a good Sunday night attendance. This is awesome. We had a great Sunday morning attendance. Wednesday night attendance has been great. I'm talking Christians as a whole across this world. Why are we not wanting to be together more and more and more? Why are we not hungering for the fellowship that we're supposed to be hungering for? Something's not right among the hearts of Christians. Romans chapter 1, the apostle Paul says in verse 11, For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end, you may be established. Go over to the book of Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Look at verse 8. Paul says, And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Verse 8, for God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and long for, my joy, my crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. Do you get the idea that Paul wanted to be with the people? that he wanted to be in fellowship. Christians, how much do we hunger for that fellowship? How much do we miss it when we can't be together and with it? Uh, We've all done a lot of thinking over the past almost a year and assessing the damage that's been done and the damage that's still being done and things like that. And the damage is there, that is for sure. And the damage has happened within the churches. But Christians, let me tell you something. We were not made to be in quarantine from each other. Uh, I'm not talking about the you get the virus and you get two weeks, you get away from everybody kind of a thing. We thank you for getting away. <laughs> Temporarily. But we weren't made to stay away. That just that's not it's not in the scripture. We were not made to be socially distanced from one another. We were not made to not have physical contact. That's not how we were made. And people, oh, well, it's just for the time, blah, blah, blah. How long is it gonna be? Where's everything heading? We were made for fellowship. We were made to be together. We were made to shake hands. We were made to hug one another, even kiss one another in a godly fashion. You say, what? The scripture says, greet one another with a holy kiss. I'm not advising or advocating that tonight, okay? You're married to somebody, kiss away, all right? But if you ain't married to them, don't kiss them. That's a very cultural thing. It's a very southern thing, because if you're in the south, you're going to get smooched on. But you're in the north. We don't smooch up here. But hug, kiss, yeah, or hug and shake hands and all that, yeah. I'd be lying if I didn't tell you that it really concerns me how fear has run our country over the past year and how it has run our churches really concerns me, Um, troubles me because I, just in talking to different people, we have wondered a lot of times, how is it possible for Antichrist to accomplish what Antichrist is going to accomplish? You know, one world government, one world economy, one world religion, how is that even going to be possible? This past year showed us how it's going to be possible because our world in lockstep did same thing globally and now everybody's rushing to this and rushing to that and everything else we've got to believe that the lord's coming back soon there is just it it is just uh, we can just watch the players getting into place and the page being set and the scene is ready to go and i'm not afraid of that because what are we looking forward to 
we're looking forward to the rapture. We're out of here. Before Antichrist is revealed and all those kinds of things, we're out of here. That's what we're looking forward to. So I'm not afraid of any of the other stuff. But I tell you what, folks, I don't want our last moments here to be lived in fear. That just doesn't seem right. It doesn't seem like what God wants us to do. How can we carry out the Great Commission if we're a bunch of scaredy cats? I mean, I'm, I'm scared to be around you. Oh. Well, then I'm not going to get around a lost person because I don't even know them. And they've got to have the, the virus at least doubly bad because they're lost, you know. Well, how am I going to get around them? There's just so much that just seems to smack against the Scripture. Paul's message to these people, he says, I wanted to write those letters to you to get you where you needed to be because when I come, I just want to have fellowship. I just want to have fellowship. I want to share in common with you the things we've been doing for the Lord. I just, I, I, want, I want family time. I want cuddle time with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I just want to love the family of God. But he also says, but if I have to, <laughs> when I show up, he says, I'm going to be strong with a few of you. So he still tossed that in, and we'll come to that, Lord willing, next week. Christians, this passage, there's so many neat, many lessons to be gleaned out of here. Grace educates. It answers our questions. Grace edifies. It builds up. Even our detractors. Grace emulates. It emulates Christ. That's what we've got to do. Tonight, as, or in this Lord's Day, as we come to church, it's a great opportunity to practice in a safe environment that which we have to put into practice out in the world that is not a safe environment. We exit this building, and we are really exiting into the world. It's not a safe environment, Christian. It's not a safe environment for those of us that hold to the truths of the Word of God. This is. This is the place to practice. And if we won't practice that here, we won't practice it there. We've got to put it into practice. If you're here tonight, you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior. Listen to me, lost person. There is no way to tell you how much Jesus loves you. There's no way to explain it. We explain it by pointing you to a cross where God in the flesh hung with our sins, poured upon him, and he's bleeding there on the cross, and he dies for us, and he's buried in a tomb, and he arises from the grave, and yet we still cannot comprehend how great that love is, the depths of it. We cannot comprehend it because we can't comprehend how wicked we are. We are deceitful. Our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, the Bible says. If you're here tonight without Jesus Christ as Savior, while you cannot fathom either one, the depth of your wickedness or the depth of his love, know that the depth of his love absolutely captures the depth of your wickedness. But you have to call upon the name of Jesus to be saved. He's not going to force himself on you. He is not going to make you accept him as Savior. There has to come a point of brokenness, humbleness in your heart where you recognize yourself as a sinner. And you confess that, that everything you've tried has, has been an, uh, an insult against his grace and his mercy. And Calvary and an empty tomb. And tonight you repent and you say, God, forgive me. There is only one way to be saved, and it's your son, Jesus Christ. Receive him tonight as your Savior. Stand with me, please, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Our Heavenly Father, this evening, we are thankful, Lord, that as the Apostle Paul addresses this church, he shows us how to graciously defend ourselves, even in the midst of hateful and ugly accusations. He shows us how to live among the family of God. And as Christians, may we aspire to that tonight. 
And may we commit ourselves to you, Lord, and to one another, to serve one another in love, to love one another as we serve. Father, we pray tonight for that lost soul. We know that you love them tonight. We know that they need to be saved. And tonight, Lord, if there is a lost soul here, give us the opportunity to introduce them to you. We pray and ask it in Jesus' name.